Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're having a wonderful day learning so much from so many important people, such as Kate Stanley, uh, the interim chair of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. Wow, to have you on the show, Kate. I am so excited. Do I look excited? No. Oh. <laughs> That's all right. I'm still excited to be a Democrat. So. <laughs> so you're the interim chair. That means you are waiting for Gordeaux. <laughs> so when is the when is the final chair coming? Well, what what we happened to us was COVID-19. So we didn't have an in-person convention the la last weekend, the uh, Memorial Day weekend in May, which the, which would have been the event and the convention of which would elect a new chair. So now we're going to have an electronic convention. People are going to vote through their computer and we will complete that process and have a new chair about July 26, at, on July 26. So I'm chair until that time. So I promised the party that I would help them through the precinct elections, which were finished on March 4th, just before we got shut down. And that went well. And then the party run presidential primary. Now, this is a new thing for the Democratic Party because we used to do our presidential preference poll at the caucus meetings when we had our precinct meetings. But the DNC encouraged states to go to a uh, prim primary. So the state didn't want to run the party primaries, so the state party decided we could run a primary. And then we had a committee that was appointed and they developed a plan. We raised the money to pay for it. And that's how we had a mail ballot election party run primary to express our presidential preference. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened is that we confused a lot of people because as you know, the state has gone to an all-male primary, which will occur in August and then in the general. So, and many people in Hawaii who consistently select the Democratic ballot thought that they were Democrats, enrolled party members. But that's not so. You have to actually enroll in the party. You have to register to vote and be a card-carrying member, enroll in the party. That entitles you to vote in this party-run presidential primary. So we had a committee that developed the plan. We hired a, a vendor, Merriman River Group, to run the election for us. And we chose to use ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting allowed a voter to choose up to three candidates. So you could vote for Biden, Sanders, and Yang, or any combination of the names of people who are on a ballot. We had about wait, wait, wait a minute. Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm out of step here, but neither Sanders nor Yang, uh, both of whom you know were very credible candidates, are no longer candidates. So why would I? What's the point of having them on the ballot? Well, because the ballot. People had to drop out of the ballot by, before we printed our ballot. Oh. So they didn't. So they were on the ballot. So though most people chose Biden or Sanders, but there were people who wanted to vote for the other candidates. You know, we had, um, we actually had Michael Bloomberg on the ballot, Peter Buttigieg, Tulsi Gabbard, Amy Colshire, Deval Patrick, Tom Steyer, Elizabeth Warren, Andrew Yang, and Uncommitted. So what happened to us was Super Tuesday happened at the same time as our ballot was delivered to homes in Hawaii. So unless people took their name off in early February, as did Kamala Harris, they were still on the ballot. But most people who voted in the primary are pretty politically active and they paid attention. So they knew who had dropped out already. So most people voted for Biden 
or Sanders, though other those other candidates did get some votes. But because of ranked choice voting, what happened was if you voted, say, for Yang first, because you really liked Andrew Yang, but you picked Biden second and Sanders third, your ballot would be counted according to your ranks. So your first ballot for and your first vote for Andrew Yang wouldn't count because he didn't reach 15% of the total, which would have been entitled him to a delegate. But your second choice, Joe Biden, did reach 15% or when you moved his vote, you, that second choice to him, he got more than 15%. He got well over 15%. He actually got 67%. And Sanders got, I mean, pardon me, Biden got 63%, Sanders got 37%. So ranked choice voting worked very well for people who had second and third choices when they, when they say they wanted to vote for Elizabeth Warren, but they voted for Sanders second. So lots of people's votes got counted. We only had 1,424 people out of the 33,000 who none of their choices counted because they didn't pick anybody who reached 15%. But 1,424 out of 35,000 is not very many. So most people got their first, second, and sometimes their third choices. Mm -hmm. So people, you know, got to express how they th thought, who they wanted in their preference. Mm -hmm. So, and we only had 68 vo voided ballots that were incorrectly marked. So it was clear on the instructions how to vote, how to select the ranks, and what and what to do. So from that point of view, everybody was really happy that that seemed to work very well for the members of the party. Now, the big confusion we had is we had many people who thought they should have had a ballot who weren't members of the party. Or people who gave us misinformation, like they moved and we didn't have the correct vote. We needed to have the correct voting address. So there were some hiccups and things that you would have to improve if the party decides to do this again. Mm. Oh, this is not a, a permanent change in the voting system within the party. This is something that would have to be decided, uh, what, every year? No, every four years, because this is the presidential part of it. Okay, all right. Can we do that every So for, for other determinations by the party, um you'd fall back on the regular voting system so the party doesn't run the other primaries the state does you go and declare yourself as mm -hmm. a democrat or a republican or aloha aina and the state runs the primary in august people will get a ballot and then the instructions will say vote all on the democratic Part of the ballot or all on the Republican. If you crisscross, your vote won't count. They run, as most states run the primary, and in fact, most states run the presidential part too for the various parties, but not in Hawaii. Okay, just the presidential then. Just wondering though, hypothetically, hypothetically, suppose, um, suppose um, Andrew Yang won in this um, paper ballot, mail ballot experience you had. Uh, what would happen? Would he would he be our nominee from uh, from Hawaii? The no. Democratic nominee. He would have to have like one. If he got fifteen percent, he'd be entitled to one delegate. Then it would be up to Andrew Yang to then we would elect somebody to represent that, but it would be up to the Yang campaign to instruct their delegate what they wanted it to do. And they may say, we would prefer that you don't vote for Andrew <laughs> Yang because he's withdrawn, please yeah. vote for Biden. 
you know, I know this, I know there's some discussion about this, Kate, but I, I'm wondering whether, at least in Hawaii, maybe other places, I, I know there was a, some litigation about it. Um, is, is, the, uh, is the delegate obligated to vote for the person that was selected in the primary or in the, in the party, party vote that you had? Uh, or can a delegate vote for whoever he wants in his best judgment? No, you're pledged. So you have to vote for the person you pledged to. You have to report that vote. Now, because um, the next step after we elect our delegates to the national convention, then the Biden and Sanders campaign have to decide how they're going to do that. Because Sanders has sort of said he's not running, but he's still collecting delegates. So he, they have to work that out so that you, the states are reporting either the division between Biden and Sanders, or they report all the, all the delegates are going to go to Biden because he's won enough to secure the nomination. Mm. So does this give does this give Sanders some leverage in terms of the platform? Uh, I guess that's what he wants. Does it give Sanders some um, some kind of special advantage uh, to be able to proxy out the votes that came to him uh, to go to Biden and extract some some promise about it? So the Biden and Sanders campaign agreed that they would honor the division in um, delegates when it comes to the at-large and the political leader and the, and the appointments to the campaign committees. So I think Biden wants to honor Sanders' um, campaign and his ideas and has agreed that people representing who are Sanders voters or committed to Sanders will have an opportunity to be delegates and to be um, uh, on the committees, the platform, the credentials, and the mm, rules committee. Mm, mm, okay, so there's still a little horse trading left, I guess. Uh, I think the Sanders campaign would describe it as they want to make sure that Sanders' point of view on various is issues is represented on all the on particularly platform and the rules committee. He had some, he had some points of view that uh, have since become more persuasive than they were before, you know, <laughs> as, as the country has suffered um, over um, COVID and uh, racial divisiveness, uh, who knows? But let me, let me ask you this, uh, suppose for one reason or another, and I, I won't even speculate as to what that reason might be, Suppose we have, suppose Biden can't run as we get closer to the, you know, I guess, the convention. Um, what, what, what discretion does um, a delegate have uh, to vote for someone else? For example, Cuomo out of New York, if he decides to run, uh, could, a, could a delegate switch to Cuomo if Biden was not available for some reason? I don't know the, the specific rules that govern that, but the DNC will have rules of the convention that would provide for how you would handle that situation. So the DNC would be involved and the delegates to the national convention will be involved. Mm -hmm. And the DNC, the Democrat National Committee has assured every state delegation that whether you go to Milwaukee or not, you will be able to vote on the platform and to announce the um, vote for president and vice president. So I, I am anticipating that in Hawaii, we won't be going to the national convention and we'll be voting from on Zoom or electronically in some manner, but the, our votes will be counted whether we are there physically or not. Wow, going to have uh, thousands of people on Zoom? How's that going to work? 
Well, I don't think you're going to have thousands of people on Zoom. I think they'll work out a system where the committees participate and they report the results. And then the delegates, you, when you go to a national convention, the delegation has a, has a delegate, a delegation chair, usually the governor, and they report the vote. So you don't have to, you're not everybody, you're not having a thousand people on Zoom being called one by one mm -hmm. or over, or 2,000, because you need 1,900 and so many votes. There's a lot of delegates to oh, yeah. the convention. Well, this is going to be unique. And so many things are these days. We, we're always finding we're in a unique situation. That we've never unprecedented situation we never had before. Um, and it's going to be, I guess you're going to participate by Zoom in the, when is the convention? And uh, I, I don't ask where, because I'm not sure that that's settled yet. Um, so, is it settled? They've chosen, that decision was made some time ago. Milwaukee is the place for the convention. How mm -hmm. they're going to conduct it is still, oh, mm -hmm. so, so. Uh, Are you going to be a delegate? No, I don't think so. I, I think that uh, I've been a delegate to a national convention. I was a delegate in 2008, and then I was national committee woman in 2016. So I've had my opportunities to go to conventions. I, I personally like to think that a wide variety of Democratic members should have the opportunity to go to a convention. Even this one. They Even the, well, let's get to that. You know, this is going to be an extraordinary election, an extraordinary period between now at the time of the protests and uh, November at the time of the election as it is legally scheduled. But, you know, anything could happen. We live in an unprecedented time. And I wonder how confident you are um, that, that we will be able to get through this time with a, an election that hangs together. I mean, what are the pitfalls that you see? What are the challenges that you see between now and, and you know, a, a responsible election, a legal election, an election that people can come to consensus about and, and give us a new president? I should say a president. A president, yes. I think we'll have a president. As a Democrat, I want it to be a Democrat. President Joe Biden. I think that the elections are pretty well run across all the states. They've always improved. There's a lot more mail in ballot elections. Hawaii has an all mail ballot election. I think the, it's a paper ballot, so that's safe, and there's a lot of security measures. I have confidence in the, in the vote, and I have confidence that the courts will ensure that votes are counted and not hijacked in any way. And I think also, um, I remember 19, you, and you probably do too, Jay, 1968, there were riots at the Democratic National Convention. So we, we, um, we've had some very rough times before and rougher and we managed to have elections, and I think we will again. Knock wood, I'm knocking wood. Let the record reflect that I'm knocking wood because, you know, there have been draconian scenarios suggested uh, where uh, uh, Trump uh, so somehow puts this off the side. For example, I mean, this is a small example, um, but he is trying hard uh, to pull the rug out uh, from funding to the post office. Now that may seem like uh, an expression of his concern over fraud and mail ballots, which I don't believe is, is sincere or true. Um, but if he's able to stop the post office, defund it, close its doors, you cannot have mail-in ballots, period. Doesn't that get in the way? It certainly would. So I don't think the post office, you know, the post office does an amazing job they delivered to us, the Democratic Party 33,000, over 33,000 ballots 
they came, they, you know, and they came on time. And we sent the ballots from the mainland and they got to people's houses. So I think the post office will function. I think they'll get some, their funding. I th think I'm, they'll- I'm knocking wood on that one too. Yeah. The, I think there'll be, you know, there's always glitches, but I think that overall, the system will still work. It's very hard for me to think that we're going to have total collapse. I mean, we've had awful situations in our past. We had the riots in Watts. We had the Rodney King riots. We've had a lot of terrible, terrible things that happened to the country. A lot of assassinations. We had 1968 was not a good year. We had a lot of go wrong. No, no. So, and we, we got through that and we will, we, I believe we will again. I think it's going to be very difficult. I think it's more difficult because of social media and instant news and cable news. So we know everything all at once that adds to the stress and, and, um, uh, apprehension people have about the process but i'm i am i am still confident and i'm confident that there are safeguards to make sure that, that well, we have well, one of them is ruth Bader ginsburg we need her to remain where she is and be our principal safeguard on a on a supreme court which is not nearly as reliable as it used to be that is correct but they'd had a region recent decision where the chief justice went with uh, I saw that so that was encouraging actually yes yeah. it, is. it is encouraging you know so so Kate the Democratic Party you know has been uh, and this is national not local but the Democratic Party been criticized for um not not uh, standing up to Trump not being organized on a national level and not being able to you know, meet the, the challenges of the time when when he is uh, distracting everyone, coming up with uh, ridiculous decisions and surprises and proclamations and the like, that many of which are completely unconstitutional. Um, and do you think those are valid uh, criticisms of the National Democratic Party? The Democrats always have challenges because we're such a diverse party with so many different points of view. And Democrats tend to um, explain, over explain things because they actually do care about the truth and the nuances and the complexity of things. And most things are complex. So Trump has this sort of way of saying the most outrageous, unfounded things without blinking an eye. And Democrats, can't do that. They're not, they're not like that. They do need to hone their message and make it simple and convincing. And I think that they will. I knock think wood, knock just, wood. I'm, notice how I'm knocking wood right on through this, this discussion. I want you to be correct on all these points. <laughs> I do too. But, <laughs> well, something else will happen. Will I don't think we're watching the demise of the United States. I think we're watching a very stressful time. You know, we went through a civil war, I mean, over a century and a half ago. We, somehow we got through that. Not good. We got, so, we got through a depression. Looks like we have to get through another depression. Yeah. We got a lot of challenges. Let me ask you about the Republicans, you know, because if you've been and you have been associated with, involved in, under, you know, in the interstices, if you will, of the Democratic Party, its ideology and its uh, organization for really for a lifetime. And um, so you have to look across the street. You have to see what it's like in the Republican Party, what they're doing, um, as if for no other reason. Then just to make a comparison, if for no other reason, you know, to understand the strategies involved. And the, the Republican Party has changed dramatically 
in the past, I, I'll say 20 years, about it, but it might be more or less. Um, what has happened in your view to the Republican Party and what are the chances that the Republican Party can return to a party that you would respect as a, as a worthy contender? I think Trump has to leave the White House as a result of an election. And I think that will help the Republican Party find Republican candidates, not people like Trump who are conveniently Republican. Remember, Trump was a Democrat and donated to many Democrats for eons. He has no sort of compass. It's just whatever helps him personally. It's not about being a Republican or Democrat. The, the, I think the Republican Party will find a new way to express some of the Bob Dole kinds of things that represented Republican viewpoints. I think Mitch McConnell is terrible for the Republican Party. I certainly hope he goes down to defeat in Kentucky. He's, he is not uh, a Republican in the best sense. He's very much into securing power and position for people that agree with his ideology. And I don't think he thinks about the country. I think he's very wrong in his uh, unable to realize that the Senate and the House must help state and local governments meet their financial obligations. We can't have a country where the, we have to lay off firemen and EMT personnel and policemen or teachers for the state of Hawaii. So um, I think that the Senate, the, the Senate and House were, at, were able to act fairly rapidly for the first three bills. And I think they will get to a fourth one which will help states and cities get through their financial crisis. Because if they don't, then we're just on a, on a spiral ever downwards. And then we're really in big trouble. The one thing the federal government can do is borrow money and help. And I think they will, and they should. On those elections in other places, uh, certainly they're important to especially in the Senate, because the Senate is completely dysfunctional these days uh, under McConnell. Um, I've always felt that uh, Hawaii has a strong democratic background, backbone and, and um, a, a sense of fairness and morality. And there are people in the Democratic Party here who can uh, actually talk to uh, voters in other states and um, you know, try to convince them by phone, call it a phone bank. Yes. Um, is, this, is this happening? Is it possible? Would yes. it be effective? Uh, where does it fit in the national picture? Both Senator Hirono and Senator Schatz are very active in helping um, flip the Senate and in campaigns, and they have active groups here that are working with them to write and contact voters and in battleground states for the presidency and for those Senate seats that will help flip the Senate from a Republican majority, thin majority to a Democratic majority. And both Senator Hirono and Senator Schatz have been active in that and contacting members of the Democratic Party to participate in that effort. And we will be doing more of that as we get, get uh, toward the general election in November. That's great. I'm glad you're doing that. I hope you can come back on the show and talk about that as you go forward, because I think that would be a, a very valuable uh, expenditure of time and effort by people in Hawaii to try to influence the decisions on the mainland voting, voter decisions. But one thing about Hawaii is it really has only one party, Kate, um, and the Republicans have you know, withered away in Hawaii. And Frankly, these days, that's totally appropriate, in my opinion, because the Republican Party is uh, not, not effective and no, you know, of no use uh, to the national interest. But um, 
I wonder, you know, how you feel about the Democratic Party going forward uh, in Hawaii. I wonder, you know, what you would say. This is my question. What would you say to somebody, a younger person, a millennial, who is um, committed to Hawaii, excited about making life better here, and who has a thought, perhaps, that he or she would like to be involved in local politics? Um, what is your advice to that person? How can that person serve? And does the Democratic Party or any political organization in Hawaii offer an opportunity, an avenue by which a young person can participate in government, make things better? Yes, I think people have an opportunity to participate in the party. We have uh, younger members of our party. We have a lot of members in my age group, but we also have uh, people who can become active in their communities and community organization and then find their way to elected politics. The Democratic Party in Hawaii is a very large tent. We have lots of people who identify themselves as Democrats, whether they belong to the party or not. And we have diverse views within the party and that brings its own challenges, but it also brings uh, richness of perspective and life experiences and uh, people's opportunities for people to contribute to the life of Hawaii, which is still a very, very good life. And I hope we'll be after we get through this pandemic. I'm knocking wood again. Good. <laughs> so, Kate, how do I join the Democratic Party? I mean, really be a card-carrying member so I can participate in all the decision process and all the conversation. Whydemocrats.org. You will find on that website a way to enroll in the party. You know, someday, sooner or later, uh, the interim chair, you will be replaced by a permanent chair, someone else. Um, and your status, your stature, your situation uh, as the interim chair will, will be over. Um, and that's after having spent a, a ton of time uh, in the political system, in the legislature where I met you originally and so forth. And what, what exactly would you, would you do with yourself, Kate? Well, <laughs> Stop being a Democrat. <laughs> Your chair, which I will be, also remains on the state central committee and will continue to participate. So I may fade a little, but not, I haven't, won't be completely off the stage. But I think it really is time for younger people, younger generation to take over the leadership of the state and of the, and of, uh, the party. And I look forward to that. Yes, it's, I think it's important to uh, allow the up and coming to come in, but it's also important to retain people like you, Kate. You're, you're uh, a, a, a special person in a, in a special situation with special experience, and I hope we can keep you emeritus in any event. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kate, it's been wonderful to talk to you, and I hope we can do it again as we get closer to the election. Good to talk with you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha, Kate. Kate Stanley.